away with the damaged Albany electric SUV. Seems like there was a suspension glitch with that vehicle. So we got a different one and it drives a little bit different than that one. The pickup is a whole lot different. Now I don't know what the zero to 60, like I was saying, of these vehicles are. I guess we can, even though it's not all that necessary, but for some people that having a quick SUV or um, a quick vehicle is important. So we'll so this one's a little slower. This one's six point four. but it has a higher top speed. So what is it like driving an SUV that's electric? Well, it's pretty much kind of different to say the least. Primarily because Now this one has a different turn in, and that's that's the other thing with the added weight to this vehicle, because uh, this vehicle weighs at least well, it weighs a lot more than a extended. Calvacade. Um, so that to say the least, it is I mean, and with that kind of weight because those are around about like 56. So you're talking about something that's weighing more than, you know, six, 7,000 pounds of a vehicle. And primarily the weight is in the battery pack um, and of course, with these vehicles being as heavy as they are and as big as they are, you can house more batteries inside of them as opposed to a standard car-based kind of SUV. And I know that there are some work enthusiasts that do not want to have something like this on a work site probably you know um, primarily because uh, you know there are certain people that try to slow down production um, you know so you run the risk of someone maybe not charging it um, because there is a lot that goes on with having an electric vehicle. So, pretty much, 
I get to work. I have to pull in, cut the vehicle off, get out, and then plug it in. And then the time that I'm inside of the facility, that vehicle has to charge. Now, if I decide to uh, run some errands, um, most of that has to be planned. Now, like I was saying, this cavalcade, it's, it's, looks like a standard vehicle but as you can see the ride height is a little bit lower now what are the benefits of a vehicle like this well the benefits are is not only do you have the storage behind the rear seat but you also have storage under the hood so you have two places of storage so pretty much now you won't have as much capacity as let's say an extended version but you will have close to that all depends on how it's packaged in front now mind you that underneath the front of this hood um, or bonnet there is also a motor and of course there's a motor back here and in between that is the battery packs and they pretty much to a certain extent go almost to the edge of the vehicle so what does that give you well that gives you a very low center of gravity what else does that give you? That gives you more stability in a vehicle that was already heavier than majority of the vehicles on the road. So, is there a benefit to a vehicle like this? Well, yes there is. And some may say, well, this vehicle is slower than vast majority of the other vehicles. Well, if speed is your desire, and this is, of course, just a prototype, but just to kind of roll with the discussion. If speed is one of your desires, there are many other vehicles that... are very quick most of the time when you buy an SUV you're doing it for the space now this vehicle can be configured in either a two row or three row so you're configuring it so you're buying it for the space and now you have an added benefit to having more storage space up front so even though you have a third row in the back you're going to still have room or more room than you would have had in a conventional SUV how much more room well like I said this is a prototype so it's just pretty much kind of a mock-up of the progression of certain things and this will also um, benefit the companies in more than one way um, what ways are those well you know there has been a lot of rumors about certain governmental situations or whatever which each individual automaker knows about And there's a buy-in, pay-out kind of a situation or whatever. So it benefits them to create vehicles like this. And with this prototype being here, um, very capable, um, 
slower than the petrol version in this state. This is probably not the best example, but it possibly could be faster because like most conventional vehicles nowadays, you have a system that you can change everything with. So, with traction control off, Now we were at 6.483. Let's see what our time will be with it in the performance mode. So we're at six seconds, maybe a little bit quicker than that. So you're almost right there with the other vehicles. Now, like I said, this is a prototype. So by it being a prototype, and you must understand that the sensation of a natural or automatic torque from a vehicle that's this size is a little bit different. because as one YouTuber put it, you know, um, to have a vehicle of this weight barreling down the street um, and able to propel at a certain velocity because there are still some conventional gasoline vehicles that don't go six seconds. Now, like I said before, it's not that you necessarily purchase this SUV to have drag races in it. The purpose of this SUV is more for efficiency. You know, how efficient? Well, it's efficient for the people who buy it because you're able to get pretty much the same miles range or even more because you have more battery packs installed in this vehicle than you have in most of your conventional electric vehicles and we're going to take this out on the street But you can definitely tell going around the corners just how much heft this, you know, the wheels. And I'm pretty sure that they will um, come up with a different type of wheel kind of a configurement so that therefore, um, or different um, suspension setup. But we just kind of wanted to take a ride in it, get a feel, get an understanding of, you know, electric vehicle to be gas station free. You know, it, it there is a different feel in a vehicle when you're driving it and you don't hear the roar of the motor and the clicking of the transmission gear shifts. And even though at times most vehicles have made these things seamless over time,
this is just a little bit different. So we'll put cruise control back on. So what's different about this vehicle than, let's say, the four-cylinder Granger XL? Well, what's different is, is that you're getting just about the same amount of range, heavier vehicle, almost the same amount of storage, but this vehicle here will probably cost a lot more, given that the standard Calvaclade is roughly around, you know, low 70s and can price upwards um, into close to the six-figure area, fully optioned. So where does this kind of vehicle stand? Because the technology that's built into this vehicle and the added storage and the luxury amenities, you know, of something different, where would this lie? Well, this I'm pretty sure would probably be a little bit more expensive. Now, rest assured that by there being approximately about six different variants of the same vehicle. So you have the Calvaclade. Calvaclade extended. You have the territory, the territory long. You have the Granger and the Granger XL. So, what does that ultimately mean? That ultimately means that there is going to be a price variation. You know, for the Granger, it's probably not going to be as expensive, but it's probably not going to be a vehicle that's readily available as soon as possible as time rolls on. And then given that there are still the petrol versions of these vehicles. So... How does that change the infrastructure? Well, all depends on who owns those stations. It could change a whole lot. You know, because most of the electric fueling stations are unmanned. So what does that do for the economy? Well, there still has to be people who have to be able to um, monitor or repair or do maintenance on these inspections on these certain devices now is that the same as sitting in a, in a gas station uh, probably not um, so there has been a lot of discussion going around where some people aren't ready 
to change with the times. And the interesting thing is, is that there are still going to be stations at the moment. There'll still be stations. So what does that mean? That means that these vehicles that a select few can afford And primarily it's pushed, it was pushed by this area. Why? Because back when Domestic Motor Company had their first hybrid vehicle a little while ago, um, most people did not want to give up that hybrid vehicle. But the interesting thing is, is that now we have, you know, all different types of hybrid vehicles and fully electric vehicles. So the hybrid vehicle is more of the compromise between the two. Um, you have a very low powered gasoline motor company by a small battery pack and electric motors so there's still a lot of different combinations but there is a push um, for electrification and most of the time the government does incentives on trying to do that So what are those incentives? Well, those incentives are whatever they deem fit. But currently, the largest automobile, the largest um, electric car company now, um, is pretty much the ones benefiting from those incentives, uh, because the other companies who are not necessarily as efficient as let's say an all electric company then those companies benefit more or that company benefits more than the companies that don't have as many electric vehicles so it's you know we're in a kind of a interesting time period You know, we'll put trash control back on. So what other things are happening? Well, there's other, you know, we've been here before, and I've said that kind of in some of my other videos, um, whereas, um, you know, I remember, uh, well, actually, I don't remember, but right before I was born, I guess they had a crisis. I can read about it, um, but I... You know, I started living after that crisis. So, with that being said, you know, um, I'm going to pretty much kind of uh, end this video here.